Um, anyway, okay, hi, welcome. Um, so today I am introducing you to a few Python tips. And the point here is, this is nothing fancy, these are a few tips that help you work effectively with Python. And I figure that um, this talk is aimed at experienced programmers who are accustomed to other scripting languages and to new programmers for whom Python is their first language. There's a, a seat up here, people. Um, this talk will not discuss programming basics, why you might choose to work in Python at all, web frameworks such as Django and Flask, Wikimedia's own Python projects such as Wikimetrics, PyWiki, MW Client, MW Project ML, or scientists computing institutions like SciPy and NumPy. I am aiming for breadth rather than depth. There's a point here to give you a little taste of a lot of useful stuff and to show you just enough to see why I use what I use. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on any one thing. And of course, all my notes and these links are available on the Open Source Grid Wiki right now, so you can follow up. So if you go to the schedule, there, are there any more seats? Uh, yeah, there's a few chairs over here. Right, there's also a Um So uh, if, all of the, if you go to the opensourcegrid.org schedule, and then you click on my talk, and then you click on session notes, you will see that I'm actually reading off of them in some cases, so you can feel like a genius when you know the next thing is going to get a set. Um, I am not going to really take a bunch of, well, you know, you could do that a different way, clarifications or pedantic well actually is in this talk. We can save that for some later. Um, if I am doing something that uh, is inaccurate, then let's actually save that to the end. I will save time for you to say, no way. Like, I think that was actually inaccurate. But other than that, I'm trying to get a steamroll here and push you through a bunch of stuff. Hi, Jay. I found two or three. So, the next step. Uh, I am going to cover four big topics. Initial setup, things to try with debugging, code style tools, and favorite modules. Two or three. No, you have a choice. Are there any more chairs? Yeah, there's a few right here. And there's one right here that right you can look over. Yeah. Um, Okay, I am feeling that kind of popular that uh, uh, makes a person who's giving a talk nervous. Um, <laughs> um, you have a choice of writing code in Python 2 or Python 3. Python 3 came out in 2008. Everyone's really slowly transitioning to Python 3. Oversimplification, but essentially true for those of you who are new to Python. Uh, approximately everything in this talk will be an oversimplification that is true enough for what you need right now. And at some future time, like, we can talk and I can unlie to you or something, you know, when you need it. Um, when, if you are writing new code, if possible, I advise you to write it in Python 3. There are some libraries and dependencies out there that are not compatible with Python 3 yet, but that is less and less of a problem over time. But today, the examples I'm going to be giving you are mostly Python 2, just because I know that when you go into a system and you type Python, the default on most systems is Python 2. If I were to give this talk again in a year or two at Open Source Bridge, probably I would switch to Python 3. We're sort of on that kind of right now. Does that answer your question, Jay? Yeah, I'm mainly wondering if following along what version you were using. So that's it is Python 2, yes. So, um, I am going to assume that you have installed Python on your machine. Um, and if you haven't, then you will have a very luxury and not hands on experience today. Um, but, if you have installed Python, the next thing you should do is install the package manager pip. This is, for a long time, Python did not have sort of the best package management narrative or story, as managers say. Um, it was difficult to know what to use. And I find it annoying that you have to do this separately. That doesn't just come with Python, but they are fixing that in an upcoming version of Python. And sample will just come with it. Installation instructions are at pip.readthedocs. So I'm going to copy that. That's this. That's what we do. <coughs> pip.readthedocs.org. And so you can install pip in various ways. Let's see. So you can, if you're on Debian or Ubuntu, you can just sudo apt-get install Python pip. If you're on Fedora, you can do these things. I don't really know how Macs and Windows work, but the people who wrote this page do. So I'm going to pause for a minute or two now, just to allow some, at least some people to install PIP if they haven't already. The 
this is going to be super boring to people watching the video unless they also use this time <laughs> to install PIP. And that is fine. Last one. Mentioned brew. Okay. Well, home brew will install the PIP. So brew install the PIP. Oh goodness, that's not on here. Interesting. That's why it's brew. Thank you. Yes. So if you are on a Mac and use homebrew, then you would brew install PIP. Is that what you're saying? Cool. That's good to know. Just wait. That happened. Thirty more seconds. People who run the OSP Wi-Fi are probably like, okay, that's an interesting little localized spike. <clears throat> All right. So now, um, it is your interface to the Python package index, also known as PyPy. That is where most of the Python ecology lives in terms of reusable Python code. And so I can show you what I have installed via the command pip freeze, which as far as I'm aware has nothing to do with Dr. Freeze from Batman, but it might. I don't know. Notice that this lists things that I have installed, these various Python libraries, and what version number they are. So uh, I am probably opening myself up to some kind of vulnerability by telling all of you this. I don't actually know. Um, so uh, beautiful soup four. I have not just beautiful soup four, but beautiful soup four dot one dot one. So you can note this if you want to easily tell somebody, ah, this is what version is. Uh, let me show you me installing something via pen. So. Because I'm installing this globally across you know, my entire computer, sudo pip install, let's say, simple JSON. Oh, it looks like I already had it. But that is how easy it is to install something. So you see that I have a lot of stuff here. And I'm actually going to minimize this. It's maybe a little distracting. Um, okay. Say again? Say don't minimize your work. <laughs> <laughs> don't minimize my work. Uh, my friend Fury from the Peanut Gallery. Um, so um, you can see I have a lot of stuff here. And it's great that I have access to all those modules, but this causes two problems. One, what if I start working on two projects that require different versions of a particular module? Let's say one of your code bases needs iClitter version one, the other needs iClitter version two. Second, how do I keep track of and easily tell somebody what dependencies a project requires? So we use virtual environments, and sometimes you'll hear people call them virtual ends or vends. So there are installation instructions about virtual environments or vends in the notes that I have put on the open source bridge wiki. I'm not going to walk us through right now installing virtual environment itself. Uh, within a virtual environment, you can just pip install something with no sudo, and then it's just in that environment. I use virtual ends wrapper which provides a little syntactic sugar, and it makes it easier to do things that would otherwise involve a lot of tedious typing. And it tracks where all the virtual environments are. And there is a link also in my notes to the docs for virtual env wrapper to install that. So with virtual env and virtual env wrapper installed, it's very easy. That was control L, by the way, for those of you who are not that uh, experienced on the command line, control L just clears away and makes it so that you're now at the top of your terminal. And all the same stuff that was in your history is just sort of, OK, now it's in my history and you have a clean screen. I'm going to be doing that a fair amount here. Uh, and I just thought it might be useful to know. So uh, let's say I want to make a virtual environment and do things in it. Make virtual and OK. That's hilarious. Why, why aren't you doing what I want? 
Um, so I'm going to uh, chalk this up to demo curse and uh, make you aware that there are such things as virtual environments and that I have to set up something in my bash RC uh, to make them work. But you can make a virtual environment, see what you have installed in there, then let's say pip install something like, say, simple JSON, and then see, say, pip freeze again, and you'll see that you have installed it. Pip uninstall something. And then in order to deactivate a virtual environment, you can type deactivate. Um, also, the virtual M wrapper makes it very easy for you to see what various virtual environments you have available to you with the work on command. You type work on, and then you hit tab, and it tells you what's available. <coughs> So um, I'm going to skip that right now, and I'm sorry that uh, I didn't prepare that appropriately. But I'm happy to show that to anybody um, later today uh, once I fiddle with my bash script. On the last bit of setup I'll talk about, which fortunately none of this depends on the virtual M stuff. The last bit of setup I'll talk about is the interpreter. The interpreter is the command line environment where you can type one line of code at a time and see what Python does with it. Is there a question? In the back? Okay. Um, you will also hear this called a REPL, which means read, evaluate, print, read. When you install Python, it comes with the stock interpreter. You type Python. Many of you have done this. By the way, would you mind raising your hands if you've ever done that? Okay, that's most of the room. That's great. That's um, hi there. Come on in. There's a seat over there. Um, so, you can see here in the Python interpreter that I can, let's say, assign something to a variable, and then it knows that what I've assigned, A, is 2. Um, I could define functions. Space, 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 print, yay. I have defined function foo, which does not require any arguments, and it prints yay. I hit enter, it knows that's new line, I hit enter again, and it is aware enough to know, okay, that's the end of creating that thing. So now, I try it, foo, and it printed out yay. The Python interpreter actually interprets Python code. This is amazing. Um, I want you to know that it also allows you to look at what attributes are available um, on various objects and Let's you see, for instance, hold on, what the heck could I do with this? Remember I made A into an int to help open paren A, close paren, and it says, here's help about int objects. Here's things you can do with int objects. There are the class, and so on. Here are various methods that are defined on that, methods that you could call. I know I'm scrolling through this really fast. There's a lot of these methods that are available. And some of them, you can even figure out what they are. Um, so I hit Q to get out of that, much as you might with less on the command line. Um, and just like on the command line, you can easily go back to something you've done in the past. I'm now hitting the up arrow. I'm now hitting the up arrow again. And again, and again, and again. So uh, I'm hitting enter, and here you go, A is 2. Um, let's say that, just like on the command line, I'm unhappy with something that I started doing. I type blah. Hmm. I, uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to hit control L, just like on the command line, that re it refreshes my screen so people in the back can see more easily. I type blah. Hold on, this is not valid Python, I think. So I hit, just like on the command line, control C. And that removes, it basically says, oh, okay, that was a foul, you didn't need to do that. Now if I hit up, it is not in my Python interpreter history. And let's say I hit down, now it's blank again. This is very similar to how the command line works in general. Let's say I want to look for things I've done in the past that had a particular string in them. This will feel familiar to you from your work on the command line if you're experienced with that. I'm using control R for the reverse interactive string search. I type A. The last thing I did with A was just to ask, hey, what is A? Now I've typed, now I've typed a space. The last thing I did that was A space was when I actually assigned A equals two. So now I hit control C. That's a keyword interrupt, and that 
place to go. And now when I hit up, ah, I see that it, it's sort of weird that way. I guess because it knows about the reverse interactive search, even though I didn't actually venture there. Or it, it took me into that moment in the Python interpreter system. All right, and in order to leave the Python interpreter, you can hit the control D key combination, but if that's a little hard for you to remember at first, you can do this. Quit. Open paren, close paren, and now I'm back at the regular bash command line. So this is super useful, but I also want to mention two other interpreters to you. One of them is especially good for sharing your work, and it's called IPython. In order to install it, you would install it with pip install IPython. Uh, if you're doing that in a virtual environment, then it's just pip install IPython. If you're doing it across your entire computer, it is, let's say, sudo install IPython on Linux. So I'm hitting control C, because I don't actually need to install it. Because guess what? I already have it installed, and I just type IPython. And now we have an interpreter. I'm hitting control, uh, or I, uh, I'll, I'll let you bask in the weirdness that is the beginning of the splash screen, as it were. And now I hit control L. Okay. Uh, it is very similar. A equals two. A. You can see that it tells you what the input and the output were. Def, foo, colon. It automatically indents. When you start doing stuff like this, you can see that the cursor is already four spaces to the right. That's nice. Print, yay. And now, let's see what happens when I invoke foo. Yay. I'm not really quite clear on why in line two there, it says that two was an output, whereas for line four, it didn't say that gay was an output. I think uh, scientific Python people who use IPython a lot could maybe explain that to me at some later time. But the big reason to use IPython is so that you can use IPy make IPython notebooks, which are web-based presentations that let you show your code and the output together. I am not going to give instructions to you on how to install and run that, but I am going to show you an example IPython notebook that was made by a Wikimedia volunteer named Merlin Van Dien. Here, you can see in 1, in 21, and so on. So you can sort of excerpt some things and turn them into this notebook. You can see the code that goes in, and you can see what the output is, which in this case, for instance, is a bit of HTML. And now I'm going to scroll down to the really cool bit, which is that it can output a graph right there in a web page, and you can also see what the code was. Um, there's a lot more you can do with IPython notebooks. There are entire one-hour PyCon talks about that, so I'm not going to go into that. Right now. But it's cool. The third REPL is great. Oh, by the way, I'm hitting Control D here. Do I really want to quit? Yes. Control L to clear it. The third REPL is great for exploring new stuff, and it's called vPython. And you install it using your operating system's package manager, like let's say aptitude on Debian. So I'm now typing the Python. You may have used interactive or intelligent development environments that were in apps living on your desktop or web-based before. This is pretty cool because it's kind of like that, but it's in your terminal. A equals, take a look at what's happening as I type. So I type A equals wiki, let's say. And so now I've created that. So now if I type A and then dot, here is a bunch of things I could do with a string. And uh, I could, for instance, tab and tab complete. I find this really cool. Um, so let's say I want to uh, swap things. S, W, and then I'm going to do open paren. And it gives me some information that I would have gotten by doing help on that function. But I don't have to do help on that function. It just pops up for me. Pops up information about what you can do. And there's a little bit of syntax highlighting. So now I hit enter. Wiki, in all caps. 
which is, you know, how one feels sometimes when one works on it. <laughs> um, it ta passive information about what you can do, for instance, when you want to import. Oh, what was the name of that library? Import B. Here's the things that begin with B. Let's say I'm trying out a new library, and I want to remember what sorts of things it can do. Import MW client. All right, MW client dot. Uh, I think I want to create a site. Oh uh, yeah, here's what I need to do if I want to create a connection to a site in MW client. And that's not going to work, but uh, I just wanted to do it as an example. This also lets you undo something you've just done. Control L to clear. I'll just show B equals two. All right. Oh, that's not what I wanted to assign B. B equals mag. All right. So the value of B is now mag. I hit Control R. It goes back to the beginning and redoes everything that I've hit enter on except for the most recent thing. So now B, it's back to being two. You can, it's a time machine. It's pretty cool. So I like it for exploring. As you can imagine, when you are trying to figure out, well, what could I do with an object of this type? It's really nice because it reminds you in this way. Uh, go ahead, Charles. Can you control R again, would it go back another one? Yes. If you control R again, it goes back another one. And another one, and another one. I don't know what happens if you hit control R more times than you've actually done stuff in the session. Singularity. Uh, the singularity is a very real possibility, so I'm not going to try that right now. Also, <laughs> yeah. How much time do I have left, Ben? We have about 20 minutes. 20 minutes, great. Right. Okay. So now I'm going to hit Control D to exit, and you see that the Python leaves behind a fossil record of things you've done. There's other cool things about the Python. You should play with it. Control L to clear this screen. Now some things to try while debugging. A lot of people don't know about the minus i option when you run a Python script. Basically, it runs the script, then it dumps you into an interactive session with the Python interpreter at the state within the end of the script when it finished or possibly crashed. <laughs> so you can dig around and see what values are stored. So I'm just going to show you a bit of sample code that is also on the wiki page. This is a bit of Python code that imports the random module from the standard library creates a range from 1 to 10, a Python list, then chooses something randomly, one of those integers, and calls it to print, and then prints that out to standard out. So is there anyone who's having trouble understanding what this is supposed to do, what, what, the, what this code is supposed to do? Okay, all right. So now, Python minus i interaction example.py, tab completed there, I hope that's okay. So it prints out one, now I can do this, dir open close. What this does is it tells me all of the strings that are in the global namespace, which is a fancy way of saying, what are the things where if I type them, I, it knows what, the, what they are. And the answer is that you see that there are a few things in there that I define, the rignum, and to print, and it also knows about random, the name of that module. So if I type T-O-P-R-I-N-T, -I, I get one. So I'm just going to try doing it again. I'm going to control D. I hit up Python minus I interaction example.py. It's a seven. T-O-P-R-I-N-T, it's a seven. So this is a way of introspecting about, hold on, what just happened? Um, so I'm hitting Control D to exit and Control L to kind of clear the screen. Python minus I spits you up after the script is finished running or crash, but maybe you want to see what happens just before it crashes, or you want to be able to sketch. You want to be able to figure out what you want to happen next just before it crashes. You're designing in a very iterative way. So another thing you can use is PDB, the Python debugger. This is built into the Python standard library. You already, if you've installed Python, you already have it. If you've ever set breakpoints in a program in another language so you can step through it, then this will be familiar to you. 
So this is a uh, Python script that I wrote to demo PDD. There are some things that happen here. For instance, I import PDD. I define a function. I set a trace. That's what sets the break point. I assign some variables. I print those variables. I set another breakpoint, And then I print spam. You may have noticed that that's not going to work because I haven't assigned a variable. I haven't, like, spam doesn't mean anything yet. I mean, spam is often meaningless, but in this case, it's especially meaningless. Oh, good, two people laughed. That's good. Um, okay, is there anyone here who's having trouble understanding the bits here where I assign variables and print things? I mean, you don't know about set trace yet, and that's normal. But is everything else reasonably clear? Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay, great. I mean, that, that sucks, right? When you're like trying to understand an example and like it's a bad example so you don't understand the thing they're trying to teach you. But, sorry, I didn't mean to turn into like a Jeff Fox worthy, like, you know, you're in a bad programming tutorial if a thing there. Um, okay, so let's say I now run this with Python demo of pdd.py. So now there's sort of this strange debuggy interpreter, or debugger interpreter thing that pops up that you will see, you know, uh, it's called the PDB prompt. And the PDB environment is different from the regular Python interpreter because it lets you step through lines with the command S or step, as I do here, and it also will let me continue to the next breakpoint or evaluate expressions. So I'm going to step again with S. Okay. So now it knows that the next thing it's going to do is print A. So now what if I try that? Print A. It knows it's 1. Okay. Now I'm hitting C to continue to the next breakpoint or until it crashes. I hit C. It does various things like it printed A, which is 1, printed B, which is 2. Um, and now it knows it's about to print spam. I hit, uh, uh, but um, this is the breakpoint just before that, I believe. So I hit C. And I get a name error because I did not define the name spam. Um, so that's the most common thing that you will do is set traces. There is a lot more you can do. There was a talk at PyCon that was called In-Depth PDD. I put a link to that video into the notes on the open source bridge wiki. And there's a reference manual at docs.python.org. One more debugging tip. When you're just starting out, you may want to know what you've actually defined and whether or not something is in your path so Python knows how to get to it. So I'm opening up vPython now. All right, let's say I do that dir command again. This is what Python knows about the moment you start out Python. A equals one, and now dir again. Uh, you see here, uh, if called without an argument, your returns the name in the current scope. So I call it, and now it knows that A exists. So if you find that dir doesn't know about a thing you think it should know about, that's a useful thing. You can see if you successfully define a variable, it will show up in a list of strings in the current scope. I call it here, so it's returning within the global scope. Another useful thing to know about is a path. Import six help sys dot path. Is anything going to happen? Well, I know that sys dot path is a list. Um, all right, dir, and it knows that sys is one of the strings that it knows about. Control L so it can clear it so you can see what happens next when I type sys dot path. This is basically the list of places on my system it knows to try to get things if I run import. This is a very strong oversimplification, but I will simply mention about sys.path because sometimes even somewhat experienced Python programmers don't know that this is a thing you can check. If you're like, hold on, why does my script not know how to import x from y? So, um, so if you can try to install some Python library but it doesn't show up in sys.path, that's something you can follow up on. Is that a writable variable? Right. 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 What? Writable variable or is it read on? I'm sorry, could you write a ball variable or is it read only? Um, that is a good question. I'm not entirely sure. Let's take a look after. Sure. All right, so I have about 10 minutes left. Control F. So now I'm going to tell you about a few favorite modules. Python. 
Okay, import random. So, let's say you want a random number from the range, you know, a, a small, smallest range. A equals range 1, 15. This is a pretty common thing that you might do in Python. All right, A, okay, let's see what A is. The range of ints from 1 to 14. Random dot choice just gives you a random choice from a list. Random dot choice A. Okay, 1, hit up, 5, 14, various things. Since you're so often going to do something like this, you don't even have to do that initial step of creating the range. Random dot ran range. 1, 14, and then it will give you a number between 1 and 14. I like that. And random.sample gives you k unique items from a list. So random.sample a, 4. So now it will give me four unique things out of that range. I think this is cool. And if you just want a random float between 0 and 1, there's random dot random. Yeah, I'm sure that some of you can imagine non-gambling reasons why you might want this. Some. Um, control L. Requests, otherwise known as HTTP for humans, basically for making basic API requests to websites over HTTP, you should not use the built-in URL into part of Python standard library because that's going to make you write a lot of boilerplate code that you shouldn't have to write. Requests takes care of that for you. And it is, in fact, pretty great. And you can install it with pip install requests. So I'll show you a little bit of sample code. This was partially written by me and partially by my intern, Francis, who is giving a talk on Thursday, the Thursday keynote. I have cut a tremendous amount of the code that we wrote so that it's easier for y'all to understand uh, for this example. So if there's problems with the code, it's probably because I cut stuff to make it easier to understand. So this is partly towards the purpose of a Twitter bot called Auto Wiki Facts that for a Wikipedia article tries to find the most obscure fact in that article and tweet it. Yes, go ahead. Can you install modules from an um, interpreter? Uh, you can, I don't think that you can install modules from within the uh, a Python interpreter. Um, I could be wrong. I think they already have to be installed somewhere on your system in order for you to import them. I think the Python interpreter doesn't want to be in the business of like putting new things on your file system in general, unless you're like specifically import OS, uh, which is the operating system. Really. Um, by the way, you can follow on Wikifacts, and it will sometimes tell you obscure facts. Um, I was trying this out once for the Wikipedia article on chairs, and the sentence was, some are decorative. <laughs> that was before we fixed it a little bit. Um, so, you import requests, and then you set up what the headers are going to be, Python dict, and then you say what you know about what the URI is supposed to be that you're going to be hitting with your query, and then you do r, uh, let's say, equals request.get, and you get that URI, and you say, okay, headers equals the thing that I said was going to be the headers. Then you can just return the JSON, and it knows, like, oh, okay, now that's a dictionary. Cool. And so it's a nested dict of dict of dicts of lists of dicts sometimes, because the Vigui API is a hall of mirrors sometimes. Um, and so then you can say, all right, grab short this bit out of that part of the, of the dict. Um, it is a lot easier to deal with than you are able to. So I'm going to hit Q for quit here, and then, okay, bpython import obscure fact. Because if you have a .py file in your path, you can import it with import in the file. Okay, obscure fact dot Wikipedia recent change. Let's see how my Wi-Fi connection, yep, so this is 
some kind of information about uh, ABE books. Um, and so it got a recent change, and if I were to run the entire program, then it would be able to just narrow down on the individual thing. Codex, import codex, UTF-8. In Python 3, all strings are Unicode, so you won't have to worry about this. But in Python 2, you will run to a zillion headaches over UTF-8 and ASCII conversion, so use the codex module. So, control D, control L, less missing from Wikipedia, uh, um, no, what I wanted to do was to change to the same from Wikipedia, now the Python, import codex. I wanted to change directories because there's a specific file over here. All right, first I'm going to show you how it works without codex and how it's slightly annoying. With open, I'm going to open a file here. Namelist-sample.txt R as F, name list equals, and we have a list comprehension here, line strip, new lines, or line in F, and then print name list. Let's see if that's going to work. Yes. So I opened up a file in Python, I opened up a sample sample name list, and then I just want to print out, hey, what's each of these lines of names? And you see that it thinks these are ASCII because it doesn't have the little U character before the opening apostrophe. And there are control characters here, which is fine, but it doesn't know that they might be Unicode. So that's not so great. Five minutes. Five minutes? Thank you. All right, now I'm going to do it to make sure that it knows uh, to treat them as Unicode because we're going to be feeding them into a Unicode aware pipeline later. With codex.open name list sample.txt encoding equals utf-8 and friend as f colon name list again to do that same list comprehension basically. Line dot strip new lines for line in F and then close that list comprehension so it's going to print out a list or well it assigns that to name list and then print name So now you see that it knows that each of those is a Unicode string. We just go. And uh, that way, it, it, when, when we feed this into the next bit of the pipeline, then we're going to um, not run into additional encoding and decoding errors. There's a lot more about Codex, and I've linked to the Codex documentation in the uh, notes to this tutorial. So, uh, how much time do I have now? We're at two minutes. Two minutes, okay. So, there is additional material in the notes about unit tests, about a way to get pretty HTML, jQuery aware, window shading charts of your code coverage, and of how you can use some libraries that are already available to automatically check whether your code adheres to the Python style guide, and you can automatically have a sort of cleaner come through and clean up your code and change it to adhere to the Python style guide when it comes to things like spaces and comments and naming conventions. And also all of the sample code that I used is here on the, um, uh, on, on the, uh, in the notes. But I have time probably for one question. I have an answer. All right, what's up? I know why you're, um, it didn't print out when you did print yay. Why didn't it print out when I, in IPython, had it print yay? Because it prints the return from the function, not what goes to your standard out. Ah, it prints the return from the function, not what goes to the standard out. Okay. And this is uh, a gist that you have just made, yes. isn't it? As J of Doom on GitHub. Yes. Will you add that to the notes on oh, yeah, the yeah, source bridge yeah. wiki? Uh, yeah. That will be very kind of you. All right. Um, 
I will now uh, use my privilege as a speaker to say, was this helpful to people? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Did you have something you'd like to say? Oh, that was oh, just a, yay, yeah, yeah. okay, great. All right, and we're out of time? We are one minute. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna call it done. Okay, thank you so much.